down. Fifty-nine years ago, in the spring of 1955, life changed for a certain David Talbot. What was originally diagnosed with the flu turned out to be a diagnosis of polio. Fast forward 50 years to 2005, when, while working with a nonprofit organization assisting widows and orphans, David saw a woman whose right leg was twisted up behind her back, her foot touching her shoulder, and using a branch as a crutch. His eyes were opened widely, and from there, inspiration took over. And soon, rudimentary plans were put in place to collect surplus and no longer needed crutches here in the United States, ship them to Africa, and distribute them there to people in desperate and significant need. Thus, Crutches for Africa was born. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, fellow Rotarian from the Mountain Foothills Rotary Club, and my friend, David Talmont. works real good if I just pin it right there. <laughs> it actually does. Yeah. Yeah. I, think I'll, I think I'll stick with that. That works all right. You hear little brushing sounds. You know, you know what's going on. You know, there's one thing about um, crutches that I've just realized that I, I really like. I can finally tell a fish story and say, I once caught a fish this big. <laughs> So, but that's the only thing I, I like about them. Um, they do attract a lot of attention. I, I built this pair myself, but um, that's not where I want to go. I, I want to go back into 1955 and the announcement that they had discovered a polio vaccine that worked. That was absolutely an incredible time for the parents of all of us that were children during that, that time period. And I can't imagine what my parents went through when they had this elation of, oh, there's, it, it's over, it's done, it's defeated. And three weeks later, three weeks later, I contracted polio. Then five years after that, no, I'm sorry, two years after that, my younger brother was born with Down syndrome. So my parents really had a, a lot to carry. But I remember things from when I was two and a half. I remember racing around in wheelchairs and crashing into walls, doing things that we would never get away with these days. This is gonna pull my beard out. <laughs> so if my head gradually goes down. <laughs> but growing up with, with kids in a ward, in a hospital ward, and some days, some of the kids weren't there in the morning. Some of them went home. Some of them died. Some of them were in iron lungs. Fortunately, I never was. And I count that as a, a big blessing. But I remember those kids uh, and watching the black and white TV that we had. We had probably 30 kids in this ward. And there were beds up and down. And all of us had had polio. It was one of the last outbreaks that was really significant that was here in the Colorado Front Range area. Well, so you got to grow up somehow. And uh, started out, I was in a wheelchair, and they, they put braces on both of my legs. I was in crutches and uh, got rid of stuff pretty quickly. Got rid of the, the brace on my right leg right away. Got rid of the crutches, and I had a brace on my left leg. And I gotta tell you, that thing was like a boat anchor. <laughs> Trying to drag that thing around when you're four, you know, and run around with your friends, it was, um, it was a trial. And part of the, the problem when I had polio, uh, they, they had to cut the calf muscle out of my left leg because it was dead. 
And so they said I'd never walk again. Well, they didn't tell me that. Now, you know, I was thinking, I can see people pretty good here. I was going to climb up here on the fireplace, but I wanted to show you what polio looks like. Because I, I know a lot of people have no idea what it is we're fighting, what it is we're doing. And uh, recently, i got to tell you, this is brain damage for me. I had to get, i got to make sure I can see everybody around the corner here. I had to get a new leg brace. Usually I just take my pants off at this point. <laughs> <laughs> With my wife being here, this is my wife, Candace. She's, she's my... She's pretty much turned into my water carrier, you know. She, <laughs> she carries stuff for me. She's so much more than that. But uh, I tell you what, I have to go back in and get a, a brace on my leg again. Uh, it took me 15 years. They told me I needed it 15 years ago, and it, it took me that long. And I wore sandals tonight because it's the only uh, kind of shoes that'll fit with this thing so far. And I'm, it, it, my leg is cold. That's the other thing, you know, is uh, the, there's no circulation. So here's, here's my new leg brace. I, I hope you can see the, the sign I've got on the back of it with Yosemite Sam. <laughs> back off. Yeah. So, um, so, polio leg. Th this is so common. And I see people with legs that are a foot shorter. No calf muscle, no thigh muscle. My thigh muscle's still there. Atrophied buttocks, smaller foot. I mean, I've got a, an eight and a half right foot and a six left. So I either have to buy a men's and a boy's shoe or a, a women's and a men's shoe and they usually don't match. <laughs> so overcoming that, you know, we, we all have things we have to over, overcome in life and I think that having a disability that's obvious kind of helps. I think sometimes people who are um, wealthy are handicapped and they don't know what to do about it. I think there's people that are good-looking, and that's their handicap. So all of us have got some sort of disability that we have to overcome when we're kids, don't we? When we're 12, 13, going through puberty, doing all that stuff, we've got stuff we have to overcome. And mine was polio, so uh, again, they, you know, they, everything they said I couldn't do, I decided I would, you know, just to prove a point. And I, I always joke that, you know, that if they had only told me that I was going to be stupid, I would have done so much better in school. <laughs> but, but for me, it was a physical challenge. So I went out, I played football, ran track, wrestled, and just, like I say, did everything physical I could. I mean, even to the extreme of running with the bulls in Pamplona. I mean, seriously. Uh, I was 21, I had that excuse. I was extremely drunk, I had that excuse. <laughs> so so it, was, uh, it was an inter interesting time for me growing up and establishing my physical limits and boundaries. And uh, life went forward. And I, you know, when I was a little kid, when I had, when I had polio, I really decided I wanted an adventuresome life. I wanted to have a lot of adventure. And that was a, a big part of my uh, extreme going after physical activities, climbing mountains, um, swimming rivers, running with the bulls, all of those things. And so my poor wife had to suffer along with me through several of those. And I took her bicycling in Europe um, one autumn. And uh, she was not convinced that bicycling through Europe was all that much fun because it rained the entire time. <laughs> so, but through all of these experiences, Candace and I grew into a, a strong couple because we experienced things together. And we had been missionaries in um, Mexico, in Appalachian, Kentucky, 
we were on a fire department in Kentucky. I was fire chief, and she was the, the fire instructor. And I got to tell you that my qualifications for being fire chief were the, was because we lived the closest to the fire department. <laughs> so... so that was, that was interesting. I got to tell you that driving around with a, a siren and a light at 2 o'clock in the morning is pretty cool, though. <laughs> Especially down in the, in the hills of, of Appalachian, Kentucky. It was, um, it was quite a treat driving over homemade bridges with a great big fire truck full of water and driving up stream beds. Guns going off, dogs barking, stills exploding, and we'd get, we'd get there and it was a pile of ashes and we'd poke around until we found their stash of potatoes and we had baked potatoes. In, I, no, kidding, in, no kidding, in our fire truck we had mustard and ketchup and, and steaks that we could, <laughs> Yeah, it was serious business. Um, so. But all of that led Candace and I into a, a career of photography and videography. And it was that that we were doing in Uganda in 2005 when I saw this woman that was trying to hop along on this tree branch, big gnarly uh, tree branch, and the gnarly parts up underneath her arm, and she's trying to hop along on this thing, trying to get to church. And I, I was stunned. And... Uh, it's interesting, you know, a lot of times you don't see things un until you wake up to something. And for me, that was a real wake-up call. To realize that there was people with disabilities, probably a lot like I would have had if I had not have had good therapy when I was a kid. And these poor people were stuck with it. And they had a, a tree stump that they could hop around on. Then I saw a boy about 11 years old, pulling a younger boy, maybe six or seven, around on a piece of cardboard. And I thought they were playing, and I asked somebody about it, and they said, no, the, the boy on the cardboard can't walk. That's how he gets around, is his, his brother pulls him around on a sheet of cardboard. That's pretty harsh. You know, and then I went into the marketplace, and I saw people literally on their hands and knees, crawling around, tr begging, and then buying food completely different picture than what we've got here. I, I haven't seen anybody crawling around anywhere in Denver. And that, again, got my attention. So that was the, the beginning. That was the seed of Crutches for Africa in 2005. And so Candace and I came back home, and, and we decided we'd do a crutch collection. Let's see if this works. And I, I checked out the Internet, and there was nothing that anybody was really doing with crutches. And I saw a lot of things that were going on with, with wheelchairs, which is great. But there's people like me in the middle that need crutches, that need a walker, that need canes, and they didn't have these things. So we started our first collection in 2006, and we collected 236 pairs of crutches with the help of the Denver Post and uh, some good business people down around Denver. We found somebody that was shipping a container off to Uganda, and that was the country that we had been in, so we had some contacts. And So again, all of this was experimental. We were just hoping that this was going to work and that it would all play out. And it did. And I remember driving up muddy roads and getting stuck and eventually making our way back up to this woman's hut very thin woman, and she actually had a Speedo swimsuit on and uh, had a pair of shorts on over that. Pretty beat up stuff. And she got up off the ground and she was on one leg and I saw that her, she had really bad polio. I, and I, sometimes, no kidding, it's just the leg is as short as up to your knee. So it can be really severe. And it can even be worse than that. But she got up and she had some wooden crush, crutches that somebody had fashioned for her, and, but we gave her a pair of aluminums. And she was one of the first people that we gave crutches to. Saw her again a couple of years ago and uh, gave her a, a new pair. Because she's working now out on her, I can't call it a farm, it's a plot of land 
where they try to grow food for their family. And she was able to go out and start working again for her family and provide food. And that's a critical thing. Uh, so at the very beginning, 236. Now let's fast forward just a little bit. And I've got to tell you that this has been a really interesting journey, traveling through, finding out how to buy a container. <laughs> you know, how to organize shipping, uh, how to organize and connect with people on the other side. And this is where it gets good, and this is where Rotary comes in. At the end of that 2006 trip that we took, uh, a fellow that uh, used to go to the same, we used to go to the same church, in, invited me to come up and tell my story to his Rotary Club, Mountain Foothills Rotary Club. Sure enough, uh, they cornered me <laughs> after I got done and said, "Hey, how would you like to be our international, our international program?" And I was, I was all in because we had met a Rotarian in Jinja, Uganda. Now Jinja is the headwaters of the Nile where it flows out of Lake Victoria. And this gentleman took us out and showed us the, some of the water projects that they've been doing to provide clean water in their area. And it was absolutely fascinating. And he was telling us about all the things that, were rotary, that Rotary was involved in. And so when we got back, I also checked out Rotary. The first thing I wanted to make sure is, is there any special underwear? And <laughs> I've got to tell this new club, that comes in a third year. <laughs> So be, be prepared. Be prepared. So, and then secret handshakes. That was the other thing I was wondering about. But uh, Rotary Pass of Flying Colors. And one of the things that really got my attention was there at the headwaters of the Nile was a big sign with four-way test. I was absolutely dumbfounded that there was an organization that functioned in this world that had this as their, their moral code. So, got involved in Rotary, and uh, I gotta tell you, it's uh, one of the best things I've ever done. I wouldn't be here tonight sharing with such good people the adventures of a small idea that's gaining momentum. And that idea became Crutches for Africa. So we, we established the idea that we could do this. And I gotta tell you that my wife and I can't, we often look at ourselves and we shake our heads, we realize that this is really kind of a crazy thing we're doing. It's pretty nuts. And I get emails from people sometimes on, on the other side in Africa. Matter of fact, we met a man during a distribution. He just didn't understand that we were doing this for free. That we were giving, well, how do, you, how do you make money? How do you get paid for this? I don't. He just didn't get it. He doesn't understand the idea of service above self. Another way to call it is altruism. And really that's, what we carry with us anytime we're involved in any of our projects and when anytime we want people to see our rotary pin I know I've got the, the big one on today but uh, we have the opportunity to change things and by far in a way one of the things that impressed me to no end was that this group of people all of you and the other million besides us are working to eradicate the most god-awful disease that has visited this planet. It's worth every penny. And, I, you know, I, I get a little choked up sometimes when I think about the people who are working on the front lines and getting killed for it. It's pretty remarkable that people will kill someone because they're trying to save their children. Seriously? And that's where when a new club comes in and new Rotarians join the snowball that is Rotary, we get bigger, we get stronger because there's more ideas in there. All of you people that joined tonight in this new club 
got imagination. Set it free. And that's one of the things that I really love about Rotary, the power of one. We have that opportunity to find those things, to find passion and to move forward and to do something about it. And we often have people ask, well, how many volunteers do you have in Crutches for Africa? Uh, hundreds and two. You know, my wife and I, I'm working 14. I've never worked so hard in my life for absolutely nothing. <laughs> and it's great. It's very, it, it can be extremely frustrating. <laughs> and there's other times when I get out of a vehicle in Kenya and there's an obviously very disabled woman that standing right there as I get out and I get out and I get my crutches and and she just is ex so excited to see me and she's just ecstatic and I'm like what is it you know I know I'm good looking but calm down <laughs> so, so she says no no she says yeah and I'm like okay yeah no I'm not good looking all right so no she said I didn't know white people could be disabled. And she said, you have made my day, no, she, you made my week, no, you made my year coming over here the way you are for us to see that there's people like you that are, that are working for us and, that, and this is a key element that see us, that see us. Went to a Rotary meeting in the capital city of Kampala. No elevator, had to go up three flights of stairs to get to the ballroom where we, we had lunch with this Rotary Club. And I was the guest speaker, and at the end, a, a man came up to me on his knuckles and his rear end, on the floor, down, down, down here. This is where he lives. And I sat down on the floor with him, and the room went silent because they suddenly saw that this man deserves the dignity to be looked at eye to eye, face, face to face, not always having to look up at people. And boy, I, you know, that struck me so hard that I had to do that more and more. And I made it my practice to get down on the ground with people. And when, and when we do distributions, we have hundreds of people that show up, hundreds of people that are desperate for a better way to live their life. And we throw things like that into the dumpster. Our goal is to stop that, is to intercept that stuff, put it to good use, its original use, not melt it down and make it into something else. But to use the crutches, the canes, the walkers, the baby joggers, yes, we need baby joggers because there's people who are so disabled that their caregivers have to carry them around on their back. So it's much better for to put them into a baby jogger or a bicycle trailer is another thing that we use. So those are the things that we're working to do is to stop the flow. And these are the people that do it. So when people say, well, how many, how many volunteers do you have? Really, I have to almost say, well, around a million, because that's how many Rotarians there are that we can reach out to. Just a, a bit about district, the district conferences and the internationals. They're absolutely incredible people. Don't miss them, because you find out what's going on with the other clubs, what's going on in the district. And who's shipping a container where that you might be able to get something in and, and make a collaborative effort. And you can find those things out at a district conference. And the internationals are off the charts. It's absolutely incredible. We have the opportunity at Crutches for Africa, with, and we've always requested and always been granted a booth at the international conventions. First one was Salt Lake City, then LA, then... Birmingham, England, then mm, Canada. Um, Montreal. Yeah, Montreal, and then New Orleans, Bangkok, Lisbon, and then this year in Sydney. Anybody want to get on that boat? 
and go out and meet people from all over the world, it is absolutely thrilling. And what's great about it for us is that we've got, the, the world comes to us. And we can say, can, would you please help us in your community? Would you please help us in California? And they are. Would you please help us in Texas? And they do. Would you please help us in Maine? And the, the district around Portland, Maine, has sent four 40-foot containers that they've collected. They've sent out four 40-foot containers. It takes about three to 5,000 pieces of equipment to fill a container. We just loaded one last Saturday. Who was there? Yay, Karen. Awesome. And you guys that are new in, the, in this club, I am so happy that you guys were there. Because that's one of the coolest things that we can do is because the next people who are going to touch that stuff is going to be Africans and then it's going to be directly into the hands of people that need this stuff. So, welcome aboard. You've uh, joined an incredible group. Um, there was something that's interesting that I really see in Rotary is the interesting part of the tolerance um, equation, I'll say. Mombasa, Kenya. Do a lot of work in Mombasa because that's a big port for East Africa. When I go to the Mombasa Rotary Club, which is every time I'm in Mombasa, there's Muslims, Hindus, and Christians in that club. And every time they give an invocation at the beginning of, the, of their meetings, one week it's the Hindus, the next week it's the Muslims, and the next week it's the Christians, and they start all over. And there's no issue. This is an organization, this is the organization that can bring understanding and if we can if we can ever figure out how to live with each other in, in peace I believe it's going to be Rotary that's going to get it done it's not going to be the UN and it's not going to be our governments because they don't get it they don't get it it's One of the things that we say in Crutches for Africa is that it's a hand up and not a handout. And when people figure that out, well, and you know what? There's a whole lot of love that stacks up behind service before self. Welcome aboard. Thank you.